Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Madame LaRouche, for your kind invitation. It's a great honor to come to Schiller Institute to Germany to present my views on the China model and its uh, possible implications. So I will speak for about uh, 45 minutes or slightly more, and then there will be other uh, eventual we'll have Q&A uh, uh, questions and answers. So I'll start with um, this uh, interesting encounter between me and Zakaria, the famous CNN host. He asked me once uh, at the conference, he said, my goodness, you know, you always say you know, China is unique and Western model cannot apply to China, but why all the Asian countries except China have adopted Western model? <laughs> so I said, uh, uh, actually at that time, it was chaired by another senior scholar. I asked him how much time I have. <laughs> Here, maximum one minute <laughs> because it's already overdue. So I said then one sentence, because China has performed better than all other country, Asian countries combined over the past three decades, as simple as that. And I said behind this is of course uh, what I call the China model. And the China model and the US model, let's compete. <laughs> Which model can work better? This is a, a quick slide to show the huge reduction of poverty in China. Actually, 70% of the world's poverty eradication has occurred in China. In other words, without China's performance in wiping out poverty, actually poverty in the world would have, been, have grown rather than reduced. And these are the, some major indexes about China's rapid development. Roughly over the past three decades and a half, China has been growing at an annual rate of 9%. Its trade, 15% a year. So China has now become the world's largest trading nation. Its total GDP by official figure, exchange rate with the US dollar, it's over almost $11 trillion. What's more important, if you calculate this by purchasing power parity, PPP, then China is already an economy larger than the United States three years ago. Yeah, that's the IMF statistics. Of course, as a larger trading nation, it's $4.3 trillion total annual trade volume and 700 million people out of poverty. China is the first country, developing country, to realize, to achieve the United Nations Millennium Development Goal, which means half poverty by uh, the year 2010. China did that a long time ago. And China has also the world's largest foreign exchange reserves, $4 trillion, uh, which means uh, this China's foreign exchange reserves alone is already larger than the combined economy of the former Soviet, former socialist countries, including Soviet Union or Russia, Central Asian republics, plus Eastern and Central European countries, larger than their GDP, these foreign exchange reserves alone. Last year, China exported more tourists than any other countries. 135 million visits made abroad which means China has produced world's largest middle class. And this is by international law standards, which means you hold a passport, you go abroad. And China is a huge country. You fly from Beijing to Shanghai, this is, you can cover 10 European countries. So virtually all those who can afford uh, air traffic in China, all those who can ride on um, high-speed trains uh, are those who can go abroad, who can afford. So which means it should be 10 times more than this. Yeah. And uh, what's more important, most Chinese are optimistic about the future of their country. This is very important. And also about the future of their own life and families. So this is uh, very encouraging. Now, this time, exactly this time, six years ago, um, I had a debate with uh, Fukuyama, the author of The End of History. 
uh, he came to Shanghai at the time of Arab Spring when Egyptian President Mubarak stepped down. When the Arab Spring was sweeping across much of North Africa and Middle East. So we debated on many issues, actually on 10 issues, but three of them I can share with you. We predict about future. One is uh, concerning Arab Spring. And he said that China may also go through Arab Spring, like Egypt. I said, no chance. <laughs> and I explained why. And I said, you know, all kinds of reasons. Then I predict accurately as an Arab Spring will become Arab winter. Yeah. So that was in June uh, 2011. So I checked. I may be the first scholar <laughs> to make this uh, prediction. I was in Brussels uh, last year. I told to EU officials, I said, if EU could only have uh, listened to the views of Chinese scholars like me six years back, you could have avoided this refugee crisis. Yeah. And um, uh, indeed, because this debate was published in Chinese and English in that year, same year. And it's published by a leading American political science journal. So it should be. The views were always there. And then uh, we discussed the political reforms in China and in the United States. Uh, he said, yes, there are a lot of problems in the US political system. But he said, it's a mature system. It can fix its own problems. I said, I doubt. Uh, I said, uh, your political system is a product of pre-industrial era, when the US had a population of slightly less, less than 3 million. Yeah. So I said, you have to go through real reforms. Otherwise, I made another prediction, <laughs> which turned out to be accurate. I, my concern is your next president may be worse off than George W. Bush. <laughs> and today, I guess most Americans may share this view. For sure, most Europeans will share this view. Yeah, you have, you have this uh, Trump phenomenon. And then I said, uh, number three, it's not the end of history, the end of the end of history. And I explained why to him. Yeah. Of course, one major reason is the rise of China. I call this civilizational state. In what sense it uh, has its own logic, different from uh, other countries. Now let's discuss China model. Huh? And um, let's first focus on the political dimension of the China model. Democracy. How to define democracy? It's not easy. So let me try to uh, borrow this famous line from Abraham Lincoln, government of the people, by the people, for the people. And then compare China and the United States and maybe some other Western country to see, uh, in the end, who has done better in terms of of the people, by the people, for the people. Let's start with. Uh, uh, for the people first. This is a, a slide to show the increase of the wealth for the Chinese people and the decline of the wealth for the American families. You look at the household net assets, the gap between Chinese families and US families is roughly 10,000 US dollars. It's unbelievable, but it's true. This is a PW survey, uh, which shows most Chinese are optimistic about their country's future, are satisfied with the direction of their country. So China 87%, USA is 33%. And this is the latest one uh, by IPSOS Ipsos UK one of the largest opinion survey companies. It put the, those who consider, citizens from their country, consider their countries are on the right track. In the case of China, it's 90%. Uh, in the case of United States, 35%. I don't know why in case of Germany, it's quite, pretty low. It's 32%. <laughs> but that's the Ipsos survey. Maybe by this time, half a year later, it's already different. But uh, anyway, this is the result of this survey. 
So above, I said, uh, for the people. So China has done arguably better than the United States. Of the people, if we look at the civil servants, the composition of civil servants, officials, in the case of China, 95% of Chinese civil servants come from very ordinary families. Yeah. So we see People's Republic is made up of ordinary people. This is technically true as well for uh, Chinese government. And for the United States, uh, Professor Stiglitz of Columbia University, uh, economics laureate, Nobel Prize, he said the United States is now of the 1%, by the 1%, for the 1%. This line is widely quoted yeah, in the media. Yeah. Now, actually, dispute comes with this by the people. So what is really by the people? Uh, in the West, perhaps in Germany as well, uh, democracy is widely associated with very simple uh, procedural democracy. One person, one vote plus multi-party system, and regular election and rotation of governments. Yet we find that in many countries, Western democracies, there is this phenomenon called elect and regret. If you look at the uh, Brexit in the UK, if you look at the uh, US uh, election last year, and um, if you look at the opinion surveys about US Congress, the approval rate is something around 10%. Yeah. So here there is a contrast. The Western approach about democracy has focused on what's called the procedural dem democracy. If procedurally it's correct, that's democracy. The Chinese approach is different. China approach said, let's first look at substance. So what's the objective of democracy? And then try to explore what are the best means, ways, and means of democracy. So we have conducted wide extensive experiments. I'll come to that. I call this a paradigm shift from what's called the democracy versus autocracy to good governance versus bad governance. Yeah. In other words, democracy at the level of substance should be good governance. And how to achieve good governance, each country, each nation should explore approaches, procedures, appropriate to their national conditions. And that will be the approach China has adopted. This is how China has tried out. In terms of the uh, political system, I said uh, if the Western approach is about election, the Chinese approach is about selection plus election. Yeah. And selection is from the Chinese culture. We have a long tradition. China was the first country that invented the public, public civil service exam system. Yeah. We call it Keqi uh, in Sui Dynasty, which means uh, 1,500 years ago. And uh, we call this a system of meritocracy. For the top leadership in China today, we have a seven, uh, what's called the member standing committee of the uh, political bureau. Minimum requirement, two terms as a governor of Chinese province, which means at minimum, we are China's most populous country. You have to have already governed 100 million people before you become one of the top seven. Yeah. In the case of Xi Jinping, he actually uh, uh, managed you know, three provinces, Fujian, Zhejiang, and Shanghai. Internal population, it's 120 million. In terms of the size of the economy, it's larger than India. Yeah. Before he came to the becoming the member of the standing committee, then he was given another five years at this particular membership. Get familiar with national affairs, affairs at the national level, and that became the top leader, president. So, so I think this is uh, the most competitive system in the world. I joke with the, uh, Professor Fukuyama, I said, with the Chinese meritocracy system, it's inconceivable a weak leader like George W. Bush could come to power. Yeah, it's way below the Chinese bar. <coughs> 
And this is what I call the uh, decision-making process with the term new democratic centralism. Actually, the democratic centralism originated from the Soviet Union. Indeed, it, it, it eventually became more centralism about democracy, yeah, especially during the time of Stalin. But China turned this process, <laughs> really changed it completely. It's a, a really institutionalized decision-making process. Essentially, it's what we call the uh, from the people to the people, first round. To the people, from the people, another round. From the people to the people again. You go through several rounds of consultations. And in the end, you reach better decisions. Yeah. And a typical example is uh, China's five-year plan. Again, it's uh, a product from the Soviet Union, but China has moved way beyond the Soviet model. It's not mandatory planning. It's strategic, indicative planning about the orientation of the country, orientation of the economy, orientation of the social development. For instance, China made decision five years ago to make the renewable energy a strategic sector. So now China the leader in renewable energies, whether solar power, wind power, electric cars, China is the leader in terms of investment and output. But this decision process goes through uh, hundreds of rounds of discussions uh, at different levels of Chinese government and society with inputs from many, many think tanks. In the end, they reach consensus. So it's very different from the American model. It's a decision by a small circle and then try to sell to the public. Yeah. We don't need to sell. Yeah. This uh, legitimacy of the decision-making process is much more stronger than the American practice. And then we have, uh, at grassroots level, what we call the consultative democracy across the state and society. In the West, uh, essentially democracy is confined to regular election in the political domain about who will become next leader. Yeah. And in the case of China, uh, it's uh, really a part of social life. For instance, in my university, in my institute, we have a union which will cast votes on performance of director and deputy director and secretary general. You did once a year. Same with our university. We want to promote, say, middle level cadre. We did that just last month. Then you have a list, all those who are qualified. You have opinion surveys for all of them. All the professors, associate professors, lecturers were asked to vote on them. And then, not necessarily the best will be selected, but it's important to reference. Yeah. We call it consultative democracy, the mass lines, the party's official jargon. Now, that's more important, more fundamental. How to understand Chinese state? And uh, I describe Chinese state as a civilizational state. What does it mean? It is, uh, uh, China is very unique. China is a world's longest continuous civilization. Uh, and this civilization is amalgamated with a super large modern state. It's actually made up of hundreds of states into one. I once said, uh, more or less accurate, I said, if you are familiar with China, you check the typical way of life and mentality of typical guy from Shanghai like me, a typical Pekingese and typical Cantonese, three major cities in China. The differences between these three groups of people are actually wider and greater than typical German, French, and English. Yeah. Even in terms of language, the dialects, in terms of pronunciation, it's, uh, the gap is bigger than German and English or French. Yeah. But of course, we have the same written language. This is important. So it's, uh, China is not just uh, one state like Austria, totally different. It's, it's, uh, uh, I use another phrase called, the, uh, it's not accurate, but to help European audience to understand, it's like the Roman Empire has continued to this day. You know. People speak their different dialects, but they all use the Latin as a written language. And then uh, it's, uh, there is a centralized government, a modern economy, uh, and the world's largest middle class, something like that. Yeah, it's not accurate, but it's different. 
So this kind of state cannot afford uh, today's Western political system. If you try this system, the country breaks up immediately. Just Roman Empire, if <laughs> continues to today, it will break up with this system. And then for this kind of country, the tradition, political tradition of running this kind of country, political governance or political culture for state governance, state craft, is always unified ruling entity, one united political entity. Yeah. So the Chinese Communist Party is different from the uh, Republican Party or Democratic Party. Those uh, Western political parties are openly representative of certain groups and then they compete with their, each other for election. In the case of China, it's such a huge country, you know, since 2000, 200 years ago, first unified in 221 BC. 95%, uh, if not more, of the time, China was under one unified political entity. Yeah. The emperor, the court, and this situation continued to this day. So I call Chinese Communist Party as a grand collision. And uh, uh, you have all kinds of uh, uh, different voices, interests within the party. But you have to reach consensus and move on the consensus. So sometimes I use another term. I said in the West, political parties are openly representative of partial interests, the interests of certain groups. In the case of China, even it's long past, uh, you have to represent so-called under heaven. Yeah. If you cannot represent, you have to claim you represent all under heaven. If you claim you only represent part of the society, then you cannot come to power at all. Yeah. So this is a very different political tradition. Yeah. Now this is uh, my quick summary of uh, the so-called China model. Huh? And um, uh, politically, essentially, it's uh, selection plus election. You have a vigorous process of selection. And then you have a process of election. And they have a unified ruling entity. Today, it's called the Communist Party. Many people don't like this, this name, especially in the West. Uh, for Germany, you have the East Germany uh, experience. And, uh, but I try to convince you it's, uh, what's more important is the substance. Yeah. Uh, some people in the West always uh, think China is none other than another East Germany, uh, 10 times larger. No, it's very different. It's, it's an older civilization, and this tradition continues. In the economic domain, it's a mixed economy. It's uh, officially called socialist market economy. But it's different from, there's some similarity between the continental model. Uh, state plays a relatively larger role than the Anglo-Saxon model. But in the case of China, you have um, the state ownership of land. Yeah. We are all property owners, but we have the contract with the state. You own the landship for uh, the, the right to use this piece of land yeah, for 70 years, and then it will be renewed, something like that. The advantage of this system is uh, uh, you can afford this large-scale infrastructure development in the case of China. Yeah. And um, then when I say uh, mixed economy, I can give an example. Uh, China is now leading the world in the mobile uh, phone uh, economy, we call this. Uh, uh, what our objective is, uh, what we call this, um, uh, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. With one mobile phone, you can do everything. For in Shanghai, you don't need a credit card, you don't need cash. You all everything paid by your mobile phone. It's already achieved. Yeah. And today, this uh, mobile phone payment is already in China larger than the Japan's GDP. Yeah. Yeah, it's 50 times of the United States. And um, uh, behind the, the typical mixed economy, uh, for instance, I was at Oxford uh, last November. Uh, China now has a, a company you must have heard of called the Alibaba, yeah, Jack Ma. 
and he invented a festival, shopping festival, shopping spree, uh, double eleven, so one, 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 uh, for singles. <laughs> but actually, in India, it's for everyone. Um, so, in double eleven festival last year, uh, the one day trade volume, e commerce volume, was larger than the e-commerce volume of the whole country of India in one year. Yeah, it's uh, 1,207, uh, 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 127 million Chinese yuan. Yeah, so it's uh, uh, about $300 billion, something like that. It's larger than the India's e-commerce for the whole year. And behind this, Jack Ma, Alibaba, is a private company. It's doing extremely well. But I say it's a mixed economy. This whole logistics, highway, expressways, high-speed trains, this mobile uh, system, 4G, 5G, not, 4G already covered the whole country, 99%. It's a vast country. Uh, all these are done by state-owned companies. So it's indeed. Uh, a combination of two, two sectors, state sector and private sector. But China's vast country have many uh, villages in the, in the uh, mountains. But China started a project called the uh, uh, Hard Paved Ways to each and every village. It has been achieved. And power, electricity coverage for whole nation, it's achieved. So all these are done by the state sector. So indeed, this is um, a mixture of both uh, state sector and private sector. Private sector extremely dynamic, and then you also have uh, the role of the state sector. In the social domain, it's more about interactions between the state and society, rather than uh, especially against the American model, state against, or society versus the state, society against the state. It's different. Because in the United States, the tradition is the state is a necessary evil. Yeah. In the case of China, state is long viewed as a necessary virtue because different, the size is different. In China's long history, two major rivers, Yangtze River and Yellow River, run across much of the country. And you know, because the, the two rivers cause regular floods, you know, and you have to control the floods. To control floods, you need a nationwide coordinations. No single province can perform this job. That's why China has shaped this long tradition of a uh, slightly larger role for the central government. Yeah. So you do whatever service, the central government always enjoy tremendous support in the Chinese uh, public. So this is uh, almost uh, always the case. Now, this is uh, uh, important. The philosophy behind the Chinese statecraft. And uh, today we have this uh, issue of uh, populism. Yeah. And uh, in my debate with uh, <coughs> Professor Fukuyama, I said I'm deeply worried about the rise of the pop simple-minded populism in the United States. Uh, he said, you know, confidently, he said, uh, uh, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln famously said, you know, uh, uh, you can deceive some of people some of the time, but not all the people all the time. You know, with the free media, with the freedom of speech, uh, we can eventually correct these mistakes. Uh, I said, I'm not that optimistic. <laughs> I'd be slightly cynical because I know the United States well. In the end, indeed, populism uh, caused a lot of problems. But in Chinese statecraft, this idea of uh, public opinion is called Ming Yi. And then you have Ming Xing. <coughs> it's difficult to find the right translation. I tried to find this word called hearts and minds of the people. Uh, in other words, Ming Yi is more or less public opinion. Ming Xing is more about the long term and overall interest of your nation or your country. So uh, the governance in China is based on Mingxing, very importantly. Mingyi, or public opinion, could reflect uh, Mingxing, 
the hearts and minds, the long-term interests of your country, or could not reflect. Because in the internet age, in this new social media age, the public opinion can shift in the within hours. Yeah. So I think at this moment of the time, history emphasized on Mingxing is crucially important. Yeah. Fortunately, we have a system which can do that through what we call consulted democracy. <clears throat> and this is interesting. I just tried to show to you. Uh, it's a study done by American scholar. Uh, that is, you know, in the West, we mention, we hear very often, even in Germany, so-called the European values or universal values, whatever. Now, this term itself is OK. The point is, um, uh, to what extent it's really universal? So this study, actually, it was a, a product of the uh, debate about Asian values in the 1990s. This study suggests that, you know, yes, there are certain values which all the peoples of all nations share. Yet, due to different political culture traditions, these values are given different priorities. And in the United States, the freedom of speech. In East Asia, there is almost no exception. It's public order. Yeah. And uh, one reason is very simple. Because you have a large population, and you have a uh, relatively smaller uh, per capita resources. Uh, so if there, if there is no social order, it's chaos. Uh, if you ask Chinese what you fear most, they will tell you luan, which means chaos. Yeah. So this is the key difference. But I always you know, share this view with my American friends. I said, you really have freedom of speech? <laughs> The uh, United States is uh, such a politically correct society. You have so many taboos, you know, far more taboos than China. You, know, you cannot touch upon. You know. But same with the European country, even Germany as well, you have this problem. <clears throat> now, that's my thinking about the American model. Uh, I actually, in my debate with Fukuyama, I mentioned briefly uh, the problem with the U.S. system, why it's not end of history. It's the end of end of history, because there are certain things which I call genetic flaws. One is this uh, assumption, you know, human beings are rational. This whole idea, one person, one vote, is based on that. Indeed, with the social, new social media, you find that increasingly it's difficult to keep rational. In the case of the United States, the involvement of the money and then the new social media. Yeah. Uh, you want to be rational, it's not that all easy. And then rights have become absolute. That's in Europe as well. Yeah. Rights, rights, rights. Uh, from humble Chinese view, rights and obligations are always together. Otherwise, uh, the society cannot uh, operate in a long term basis. And then the procedures are always the most important thing. I agree procedures are very important. But you, but you look at the West today, United States in particular, uh, from my humble observation of the world today, all countries need some kind of reforms. United States, Germany, European countries, uh, Chinese tai uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, they all need reforms. But actually, most countries can hardly reform. For one thing, procedures are so complicated. For instance, you want to reform in the United States, you need to change or revise the Constitution. But actually, it's impossible to revise the Constitution. As a result, you cannot put forward reforms. China is uh, arguably one of very few countries which can push reforms. Now, in the United States, the problem is democracy or monetocracy. There are still uh, I think in the year 2010 and then year 2014, the Supreme Court of the United States decided not to set a ceiling for campaign contributions for companies or individuals. You can contribute as much as you want. So this is not democracy, it's a monetocracy. I invent the word money talk, yeah, monetocracy. Yeah. And then the issue of weak governance, Fukuyama's 
phrase called the vetocracy. Different institutions veto each other. Then the economy is heavily in debt. Yeah. Now, this will be an interesting uh, fallout from the China model. I said the China model, uh, how it operates, and then its relation with uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So I will describe how the model operates in terms of ideas, in terms of the models, features, and then see their relations with the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. You know that uh, in the Chinese president put forward this initiative, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, four years ago. It's about you know uh, really a platform across uh, Eurasia on the land, and then the sea routes from China through South China Sea all the way to Indian Ocean, South Asia, Africa, Europe, and then to Indonesia. So this is a, a gigantic project, and when it's first put forward four years ago, even up to now, uh, it meets a lot of suspicion in the West. Uh, if you look at the Western doubts or suspicion, mainly twofold. One is uh, China is now uh, an economy <coughs> with excessive industrial capacity. It wants to <laughs> export this kind of excessive industrial capacity. This is uh, one interpretation. The other is about uh, geopolitical. Uh, China has geopolitical implications. It will create this new sphere of influence. And um, in honesty, you know, I must say, um, yes, China indeed has um, uh, excessive industrial capacity. Uh, so this argument stands, you know, China wants to export its excessive capacity. And given the size of this project, it will cover 4.4 uh, billion people along the routes. Of course, it will have geopolitical, geoeconomic fallout. No doubt about this, yeah. But I think if you only <clears throat> confine yourself to these two considerations, you miss a lot of far more important implications of this initiative. China model has one uh, feature better than Western model, that is it can plan for the future. It's really plan for next and next generation, for the next 50 to 100 years. I will explain how the China model operates in this whole initiative. And first, uh, this is called the people's <coughs> livelihood first. We all know, you know, uh, at this moment of history, a lot of countries, European countries included, are experiencing what's called the deglobalization. People are not happy with globalization. And uh, China is one of the very few countries that have indeed benefited from globalization. You may say China is the largest beneficiary from globalization. Why so? What's the Chinese secret? <laughs> Actually, it's very simple. Because China defines globalization only as economic globalization not as a political globalization. That's a key difference. Because over the past 20 or so years, globalization was actually what's called the new liberal globalization. It's about privatization. That's already political. It's about democratization. It's very political. In other words, the Americans not only want to impose uh, the, this economic liberalizing, liberalization, but also its political model worldwide. That's why you have this Arab Spring, you have the color revolutions, you have the fall of the Soviet Union, fall of the East Berlin, the war, etc. Good or bad, but China said, for us, globalization is economic only. Politically, no. <laughs> That's the key difference. So with this kind of uh, approach, China has become one of the largest beneficiaries of globalization. And why uh, economic liberalization? Because behind this Chinese logic, one of the key features of the China model 
people's livelihood first. It's a guiding philosophy. Yeah. Which, what does it mean? It means whatever you do, economic reform, social reform, political reform, you should not allow the political machine or the state structure to operate in vain or become a chatting shop. No. It has to do something concrete, tangible for people's life. It could be material. It could be more than material. But it has to boil down to something concrete for the people. And this people's livelihood first, uh, it reminds me of the famous line from Bill Clinton. Uh, he said, stupid is the economy. <laughs> he advised those politicians who want to become prime minister or president, he said, pay attention to the economic performance. So China has all along focused on this, try to improve people's living standards rather than <coughs> chanting empty slogans. The second, again, is China's model's philosophy, seeking truth from facts. That's a famous line from Deng Xiaoping, Chinese late leader. Uh, he said we should seek truth from facts, not from dogmas, whether it's from communist dogma or from capitalist dogma, whether it's about East dogma or West dogma. East dogma is a, a utopian communist outlook Western dogma is about democracy, market, represent the best, and the rest is nonsense. Yeah. So then said we should try our own approach. He called this Chinese style socialism. In the end, it has worked. And then you have this opening up at home and abroad. Yeah. In the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, it becomes what we call the uh, connectivity. Yeah, connectivity at policy level, at infrastructure, le infrastructure level, at uh, you know trade level, at customs level, uh, etc. And I try to introduce another concept called vertical connectivity. I mentioned horizontal connectivity, especially infrastructure between nations. At the vertical level, it's also interesting. You have the uh, underground pipelines for oil for natural gas, you have uh, highway construction, uh, bullet trains or normal trains, uh, sea links, uh, air links, so it's, it's already a bit vertical. What's more important now, China also put forward this uh, cooperation with the satellite business. And then what's more interesting it has to do with the, uh, the Europeans, uh, you know, what we call the Beidou system, which is uh, uh, China's GPS system. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, Europeans missed an opportunity. Yeah. Because originally, China planned to have this project in cooperation with the European Union. We signed a strategic agreement. Mm -hmm. For European, you have this Galileo program. Yeah. China has this Beidou uh, program. And uh, yet, EU has a lot of suspicion about China, whether you are going to steal our technologies, <laughs> whether, whatever. So in the end, the, the partnership with European countries on uh, this uh, uh, GPS system uh, broke out. It did not work. Yeah. So China, in the end, has done it alone. Now China is way ahead of Europe. Yeah. So China has applied this system to the Belt and Road countries. So by the year, next year, 2018, it'll cover all uh, uh, Belt and Road countries. And by the year 2020, 2020, means three years from now, it'll cover the whole world. So it will be alternative to uh, GPS system. In China, we already use this already. Yeah. So this is what I call the vertical connectivity. And then consultative democracy. I mentioned this already briefly. Now, in the uh, BNI initiative, uh, the slogan and methodology is called the discussing together, or planning together, building together, and benefiting together. In other words, a country, out of its own interest, decides to join the project, initiative or not. China will not impose its view on you. You feel it's in your interest, you can join. 
If it's not in your interest, you don't need to join. So it's a voluntary, yeah. And uh, so this is a, in part a fallout from the China model, what we call the consultative democracy. And then, more importantly, in the China model, we have a relatively strong state. But the strong state, I mentioned the historical uh, uh, legacies from Chinese long history, civilizational state. But it's also relatively neutral and relatively uh, uh, disinterested. So in the Chinese model, the central government plays such a role because you have uh, uh, different regions in China. They also have their own interests. The central government must be remain relatively neutral so that you can take care of the overall interests. Uh, I mentioned again, the China not a small country. I made a rough calculation. Um, in Europe, each country is uh, roughly 14 million people in average per nation, uh, per country. Uh, China is uh, 1.4 billion people. So China means roughly 100 average size European states. And you need a central government to coordinate this the different size, yeah. And um, as a result, you know, uh, when we look at the globalization up to now, what many countries, especially developing countries, uh, are concerned with the existing international institutions, whether IMF, World Bank, uh, WTO, you name it, they are somehow, from non-Western countries' point of view, biased towards the West. As a result, China said, let's do something more neutral. Yeah. And we tried this uh, AII, the Asian In Infrastructure Development Bank, and the uh, Silk Road Fund, etc. So these are the ideas originated from China, back with uh, uh, Chinese money and other money. So, so this is important. And they also have a sense of priorities and sequences. If you look at China as a whole, uh, the whole reform process start with the countryside, with the agriculture, and then industry, and then commerce. Start with uh, coastal areas, and then interior parts of China. Uh, same with the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, we have uh, the idea of what we call the key projects, or pivot projects, and pivot countries. It's not that all the country do it simultaneously. You have the conditions. <coughs> differ from each other. Some countries have uh, more mature conditions, so we do it first, and then try to have what we call the demonstration effect to show others, so others can decide to follow or not. So there is a sense of priorities and sequences, and this is important. And now that's another uh, interesting uh, uh, phenomenon, because many European countries said can't be successful. We met some uh, scholars yesterday. You even do not have a road map. Um, for Europeans, they, they, you believe that we must have a clear guidelines, clear road map, and clear rules to go by, and then we can do it. Otherwise, we have uh, suspicion or reservations. But the Chinese approach, if you look at the four decades of change since 1978, it's different. You know. We start not with a road map. We start with a compass. Uh, we just know the orientation, the direction. And Deng Xiaoping said the orientations are clear. First, improving people's living standards. Yeah. And second, slightly more market oriented. <laughs> so, so market orientation, people's livelihood, these are two orientations. And under this orientation, you encourage all kinds of experiments. And the central government would say, this experiment is great. Let's do it, extend it nationwide. That experiment is not successful, we stop it. So that's the overall approach. So most probably, a roadmap will emerge, not now, perhaps 10 years from now, uh, for uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So now there is some interesting developments in all the time. And then building bridges between the old and the new. This is also a very important uh, um, feature of China model, how it operates. For instance, in the process of China's change over the past four decades, state sector, or the reform of the state sector, came much late. Rather than 
we have kept the state sector intact, but we created a private sector from scratch. And then we try to build a bridge between the state sector and private sector and let them compete each other. And the state sector has to reform itself and then become partners. So that's the overall approach. So in the Belt and Road in Initiative, same is happening. You have the existing arrangement, like in, in Russia, they have this what's called the Eurasian, I don't know how to translate, Eurasian uh, uh, alliance, in economic alliance, something like that. Yeah, union. Uh. And then China said, that you stay with that. We build a new bridge between BNR and your plan. Yeah. Same with in Kazakhstan, they have what's called the shining road. Yeah. And I said, stay with that, and then we build a bridge between the two. See, the two sides can cooperate. Same with the World Bank. You stay with this, we have cooperation with the World Bank. So rather than scrap the, the existing, the old one. And then you have to create a new economy, yeah, new drivers. So the Chinese model had this, uh, if you ask Chinese official uh, how to uh, develop economy, he will study with you what will be possible new drivers for the economy. And let's do it together how to develop new drivers. And last year in Hangzhou uh, held this um, G20 summit. And why the choice of Hangzhou? Because Hangzhou was the headquarters of Alibaba and other large companies, extremely dynamic. It's the first Chinese city which uh, you can survive without cash, without credit cards. Uh, you can buy a, a bottle of water with whatever you have, mobile phone. Uh, so it's very easy. So the new economy shows the road. And then uh, there is a Chinese word called shi, yeah, which means uh, overall trend. Rather than, you know, uh, it's like playing Chinese uh, a game called Go. Huh? It's uh, a kind of chess, but it's different from chess. Uh, it's not physically you destroy uh, one enemy, uh, two enemies. It's about uh, creating space and trend. If this trend is favorable to you, others will follow you. <laughs> you have no choice, no other choices. It's like AIIB, Asian in, in Infrastructure Development Bank. Uh, in the United States said, no, it's not good. Japan said, no. But China created a trend, shi. So all other countries want to join. <laughs> UK takes the lead. Uh, other countries. Germany also is part of them. So by the end of this year, we expect this uh, uh, AIB will have a membership of 90, yeah, 88 to 90 members. So it will be an international uh, financial institution already. So that will really reshape globalization from what we call the, uh, zero sum to win-win partnership. And my last slide is to uh, show my projection about China's future or Chinese socialism. And uh, China will become the world's largest economy uh, in 10 years. Uh, that's by official exchange rate. If it's uh, by purchasing power parity, China is already the largest economy. And China now produces one UK in terms of GDP every three years with the extra G GDP for every year, three years together, you produce one, the size of the UK economy. Yeah. And China's middle class will be twice the US population in a decade. Uh, uh, today, China middle class of about 300 million. Yeah. So 10 years from now, China will have a middle class, my own estimate, at least 600 million. So twice of the US population. Uh, for one thing, China has now already uh, produced world's largest, I don't like the word, property class, when all people have properties. In the cities, 90, it's 85%, uh, yeah. And in the countryside, it's 100%, yeah. And uh, I just checked the latest data. The average, uh, what's called the uh, uh, surface, uh, room surface, or the conditions is 40 square meters. So 
States uh, uh, even slightly larger than Germany. Yeah, it's uh, unbelievable. It's just within uh, four decades. Uh, in Shanghai, when I was a boy, the average space for a typical home was four square meters. Now it's ten times bigger. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah, and. Uh, of course, the largest uh, medical insurance for all and pension for all. China has achieved that. <laughs> we just look at the U.S. You know, this this medical whatever care reform, almost uh, lasting for 100 years and not achieved. But China has done this within five years. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, of course, the level of uh, protection differs from region to region. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the basic uh, insurance pension for all has been achieved. And also China will produce more tourists, as is the case now and in the future. And China now the world leader in alternative energies, renewable energies. So eventually it will have this kind of impact. So eventually it will not um, uh, this paradigm of democracy versus dictatorship, rather it should be good governance or bad governance. And good governance can take the form of the Western political system, but it can also take the form of non-Western political system. Likewise, bad governance can also take the form of Western political system, can also take the form of non-Western political system. And, and the global impact will be enormous. I think you know, at, up to at least a few years ago, it's called vertical order. The West, especially United States, is above the rest in terms of wealth, in terms of ideas. But this order will become more horizontal. Yeah. So the rest, especially China, will be on the par with the West in terms of both wealth and ideas. And many thanks, the picture from Shanghai. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much. Before I end my speech, I should also say a warm thank you for the beautiful song. And this uh, uh, jasmine uh, flower is the famous song not only for uh, all the Chinese, but for me particular, because this song focuses on from my province. I was born in Jiangsu province, and this song is from Jiangsu province. And I'm deeply touched. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.